Welcome, everyone. This is yet another episode of Disruption Talks, and today we will be talking about a sweet little thing called insurance. To be honest, myself, given my young age, I am still ahead of considerably thinking about insurance as a part of my life for my place, for my car, for my belongings, myself. But, well, increasingly, as I grow up, these things come my way. And much like most of you probably didn't love your bank but have grown to love your Revolut account, uh, the same thing between the incumbents and neo banks is happening in the insurance space. So against the typical company that does your insurance that you might have heard from your parents or you might have seen on some skyscrapers, there are many new players in the insure tech space. One of them is GetSafe. And today joining us is Conrad and Anthony from GetSafe. Uh, hi, guys. Hi there. Um, I think I could say to the audience that Anthony is the you know, VP of engineering, Conrad is the VP of product and data, but I think it's best if you just give us your own introductions. So Anthony, could you start? Sure, happy to. Um, hi, yeah, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm Anthony Meyer, as you already said, VP of engineering here at GetSafe. Um, I've been with the company now since uh, October, um, ba based here in, in, in Heidelberg, uh, in the surrounding area. Um, be before before GetSafe, I actually um, worked mostly for Silicon Valley-based companies. Um, I spent a few years working remotely from Germany um, for a company called Nextrol uh, in the marketing tech space, um, and before that for Yelp, um, and I, I used to live over there. Uh, I'm, I'm originally from Germany, uh, which is why a couple of years ago I decided to move back uh, from the U.S. over here and um, was, was happy working for, you know, American startups. And then um, about a year ago, um, I, got to, I got to meet some people from GetSafe and, and realized there's some, some really exciting opportunities um, in, in the space. And, and it was great to see a, a, a real tech startup uh, building up in, in my home area. Um, so I, you know, I had to jump on board. I had to, I had to take the chance and, um, been, been super happy so far, uh, these last, uh, nine months. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, when, when I'm not working, I, uh, I'm generally, uh, spending time with, with my wife and my dogs, uh, doing a lot of hiking and, and that kind of thing. So hiking is all we got with this no traveling space, right? Yeah, so, that, uh, that... <laughs> Conrad. What about you? What's your elevator pitch? Yeah, happy to be here. So I'm Conrad. I joined GetSafe one and a half years ago, roughly, uh, taking over the data team back then, and then also took over the product lead around half a year ago. And um, it might seem a bit weird that I have those two roles, but actually looking at my background, it's, it's kind of obvious as I've been crediting from physics and math, and then kind of spent my whole professional life in between strategy consulting with a big focus on digital products, um, product management and uh, digital business models and data science. Um, so I've also been like a data science freelancer in between founded like a small company with friends as well. Um, so I've always been in between worlds, right? And now I'm living uh, kind of the perfect role that I'm having at, at GutSafe, um, suiting me very well. And um, I hope GutSafe as well, of course. And if not working, uh, I do have a wife and three kids. So that pretty much defines what I do in my spare time, taking care of them, spending time with them. I love traveling. I uh, love doing sports. That's it. Okay. No wife, no kids. Everything is going to happen in the future here. But uh, bear with me. But back to get safe. Uh, I'm curious, what does a day in the life look for you guys like? And other than just hearing your personal answers conrad maybe since you were just uh, just talking you could you could tell us first and then anthony would go about what's the what's a day of your life at get safe at your position like and then the next question is going to be how do you guys collaborate sure um so my my day is usually full of one-on-ones right so i love to spend time with my direct reports and team members uh discussing any kind of issues they they have, helping them to overcome them, um, uh, or brainstorming together. Then, big part of my day, it always comes in waves, but uh, it's a big part is hiring, actually, as we grow very fast. So it's always like 
super important to stay ahead of time and try to hire for basically a team in six months. That's that's a challenge, but but I really love it. Um, then a big part of my time is strategic planning, right? Uh, so most of our teams are really focused to, so we work with the OKR uh, framework, um, setting goals on a three-month time scale. And uh, especially Ant and me are always trying to look a bit like further ahead, trying to anticipate what might come and trying to plan ahead. And then there's a big part in just talking to other VPs, other heads from lots of other departments, um, a lot trying to understand the vibes and um, any kind of things that we need to align on, uh, not only within product engineering, but within the whole company, right? And trying then to foster that. Okay. That's it. Okay. And sometimes, maybe to add, sometimes if there's sometimes some time left, I try to think about topics myself. <laughs> need to block that actively. Yeah, I know the feeling. Um, but yeah, for me, um, you know, a, a lot of, well, first of all, you know, it's, it's uh, nice after, after a long time uh, working from home, we uh, are finally kind of started to be in more of a hybrid setup where we're back in the office a little bit. Uh, so it's been great to actually get to collaborate with some people <laughs> in person again, slowly but surely. Um, but, but yeah, a, a lot of, um, a lot of my day is, is spent with, with my team. Um, we, um, the, our engineering team is, is broken up into kind of a squad model and um, currently I'm still um, actively involved with um, leading a few of those. Um, partially partially as we scale up, it's, it's just kind of necessary to support the team and, and partially it gives me a uh, chance to be a little closer to the team. So um, part of my day is spent in, in stand-ups um, or plannings depending on the day of the week. Um, and, you know, making sure things are going smoothly for the team, the projects are going well. Um, make sure if they are blocked by anything, going to figure out what's going on with other uh, departments or see what we can get what we can get moved along. Um, a lot of my my day is also spent in in one on ones, um, both within my team, um, making sure you know um, everything's working for for everybody on the team. Um, what are their um, you know kind of what are their ambitions? Where do they want to grow in their career? Um, trying to make sure they can move forward. Um, and then, then, you know, seeing where we can push our technology forward and look for those new opportunities and, and making sure to kind of pull ideas out of individuals as well, wherever possible. Um, and then also a lot of one-on-ones with kind of um, other other departments. Um, and then um, a, a lot of what I, I care about and focus on is just that the processes are running smoothly, right? That the, the way we, that both the way um, my team works, um, but also the way we work closely with with product and design and um, other departments, um, that's all going well. And seeing, you know, are there any adjustments we need to make um, to how how those things are working? Um, often, a lot of my days spend uh, in meetings with Conrad, so we, so he and I talk. Uh, probably <laughs> dep depending on the day. Some occasionally there's a day where we realize we had no meetings together, but I think uh, it's it's not uncommon for us to have two or three hours of meetings uh, together in a day. So we we try to work very closely. Together, so you know, strategic planning is something I'm, I'm, uh, you know, directly involved in as well. So we're, we're, we can make sure we're in lockstep and also um, planning ahead. So, okay. So when you're not in a marathon on one on ones, you spend time collaborating, and then anyway, you still end up on an interview together on a public one on one or a two on one, essentially. So just can't yeah. escape, can you? Yeah. Uh, exactly. Another thing that I'm thinking is the prior experience that you guys mentioned, your respective prior experiences, uh, how that impacts how you're leading the teams uh, at GetSafe. Uh, strong software engineering on Anthony's side, of course, strong consulting background of Conrad. Uh, I'm just curious how those things transfer from, uh, for example, I heard Yelp. So we're talking, uh, you know, one of the, let's say, OGs of the of the tech startup world. So I'm, I'm curious how the learnings from places like that and your respective paths carry on to 2021 VPs at GetSafe. Yeah, absolutely. Um, happy, happy to start. Um, so, um, yeah, I think uh, GetSafe is now the fourth or fifth, depending on how you count it, uh, startup tech company, startup slash tech company I've worked at. And I've tried to kind of along the way, always uh, grow and learn, you know, with the processes and um, both where I can, where I can learn something new from the team or the processes in place, but also where, where can I bring something along the way? So um, 
you know, for a long time, I was, I was myself an engineer. Um, but for the last now five years, I've been, been leading or managing um, teams often. So um, it's, it's a lot of my focus has been on making sure things are going smoothly. Um, I've had some, I've had some great mentors along the way who've, um, helped me with those processes, but yeah, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of what I did when I got to get safe was say, Hey, what's, what's working really well here, right? What's, what, what are kind of the, the core of the team, you know, where, where collaboration is super strong. Everybody wants us to work very closely together, which is great. You know, love to see that. Um, and um, working, you know, trying to get to quick decisions, um, moving quickly as we as we grow fast. Um, but then also trying to bring in some more standard processes, right, that will help us scale better um, and kind of um, more smoothly, right. Um, you know, as a startup is kind of in, in small mode, it's it's often um, organized chaos, and uh, now I'm trying to make it uh, <laughs> a little more organization. So um, one one of the first things um, I did when I got to get safe was was bring in um, more standards, like make sure all all teams, you know, all the engineering teams were doing stand ups and involving product managers with those and doing um, you know plannings. Uh, we do we do one week sprints, so um, we have a pl weekly planning. Um, also trying to make sure we had a standard project management tool before it was some people were using Asana, a little bit of Jira, a little bit of Trello, a little bit of Google Docs. Um, so trying to bring that in place. And um, yeah, and a lot of that kind of ended up bleeding over, I think, a little bit to um, the, the product organization and kind of, kind of other bits. So, um, but I'd, I'd let Conrad talk about that a bit as well. Yeah, sure. So, so maybe first of all, from my background, I, I have a strong background in consulting, and this is typically, I'd say, or has been, still is, I guess, a quite hierarchical um, kind of leadership that you you experience there. Um, and I found it very valuable to experience that because I think it clearly got me to see the pros and cons of it, um, and I think it works quite well. Um, to have those strong like hierarchies um, whenever there's kind of a clear and proven path to success. Right? So it's basically you have some best practices. You did this project before. It's like three month uh, defined scope and just go ahead and execute. I think there it works quite well. But I also saw, um, especially from basically what I consulted in, that the year as soon as you go in the space of not specifically knowing what will bring you to success and where you need really like pride ideas, right? And you need to explore a lot um, to get to those and to prove them right, um, then this won't work, right? And I experienced it my, myself a lot. So um, I think it shaped my leadership style quite, quite a lot as I truly believe that within that space where creativity, exploration is needed, uh, new ideas are needed. There's no no proven path. Um, it's all about creating, like giving a strong purpose, first of all, giving people a strong purpose, um, creating a high alignment through common goals and clear goals, um, but then also giving the autonomy to basically work autonomously in their teams, like given certain, of course, principles and certain rules, right? Um, and that's what I think would describe kind of the learning that I got that this for me works um, in, in uh, what I believe in, right, works best. Um, and that's also how we, uh, what Anthony basically described, that's also how we set up our teams. So we work in uh, really autonomous squads, right, covering the whole value chain of our, of insurance in the end. So we have um, multiple squads, each squad consisting of a product manager, um, a designer, a data person, and of course, um, a couple of engineers. And they are autonomously working on a specific field within the product and have full responsibility there, right? And um, doing that, we can make sure that Ant and me, we align with the teams on the direction, the goals, and some rules. Um, but then we let them run themselves and let them also take decision themselves, right? Which uh, really works uh, well. Okay, I I have to warn you uh, at the the at the end of this, there will be a non technical question where I'll ask you for the advice for cool. other other VPs and other people who are in the position to to lead. So 
that but we always start with the personal prism to get the audience familiar with you but let's dive right into the company prism and talking about the product so cool. i wanted to ask you what's the latest with get safe how was 2020 2021 is and how will 2022 be but phrasing that in a product question context are there any new product features that you can uh, you know tease a little bit and if not uh, maybe talk about some of the exciting engineering or data challenges that you have already worked on that you can discuss. Ideally, both. I, yeah, cool. My, may, maybe I can do the intro. So um, right now we're basically putting lots of um, lots of transaction that customers do with an insurance company into the app, right? So we're really uh, doubling down on using our app, our digital product as uh, basically the channel and the tool that the, the customer can use at their fingertips. Um, there are lots of smaller use cases in there, uh, but I think the biggest um, thing that we started to tackle and lots of exciting things will soon follow is, is claims. Um, so we started putting the whole claims experience, claim status tracker, um, soon more into the app. And I think Anthony wanted to talk about it anyway, right? Yeah, I, I can I can mention a little bit, but yes, yeah, I, I totally agree with Conrad. You know, claims is one of the areas where um, you know we're trying to really push ahead. I think um, you know the whole reason people have an insurance product is that you know unfortunately things happen, and uh, when they do, we want to be there to to help them. You know, that's that's why they file a claim, then tell us what happened, and it's it's a confusing process for a lot of people, and it's hard, and you know. Um, and we want to make it really easy, right? We want to make it fast. We want to make it easy. Um, so we've always had the ability, or not always, but but for a long time, for a long time, get safe already had the ability to actually file your claim um, through through the app. Um, but then often, just because of the nature of of insurance and how these things get processed, people had to be involved, and they still are. They you know they're in the background, but um, we're we're trying to make it easier um, for customers to to manage everything in the app, like, like Conrad said, um, you know, one of the things we're starting to look at, uh, nothing we can quite, quite talk about fully, but it's like, how can we make it, um, even faster and maybe more automated, um, to, to start making some decisions around whether, you know, whether your claim is accepted or not. Um, so the customers can get their, you know, answers, um, you know, maybe even uh, instantly in the future, but we have to we we'll have to kind of see how that goes. And a lot of it's kind of dependent on the insurance products them, themselves. Yeah, right. I mean, sorry, go. Yeah, I think it's, it's you know, one of the most exciting parts for me in insurance, it's in the end, the, the kind of the feature is super simple for the customer, right? Someone, f you file a claim, you answer some questions, you click a button and you get an answer very quickly, but actually the complexity to handle in the back is super large, right? And there's lots of like uh, cool tech systems um, and data science problems uh, behind that we need to solve. And for me, that's one of the big, like exciting challenges, like trying to get this complexity of insurance down to like a simple button and this one simple click right in the end. Uh, that's one of the fun parts. That's exactly what you heard me talking about in the beginning, because like, you know, I like to occasionally think of myself as a mature reasonable person i'm 26 i have a job i'm doing these interviews every week but still i should have insurance you know just on lock but i don't and one of the reasons when i think about it is that well lo and behold i'm human like everybody else and i operate on things like fear of the unknown i am not familiar with everything in the insurance industry i don't want to be familiar with all the things in the insurance i just want to be protected i just want to be insured but i don't really want to be figuring out all of those things and overcome this high barrier of entry so simplification is the is the overarching trend of whatever is happening right um totally so any advice on building such high performing engineering product teams we we touched on on some of it a little bit, you know, um, earlier, right? Like one of the things uh, we we really try to do is, you know, um, you know, we're hiring smart people. We want to give them the chance to, you know, work independently, show what they've got. You know, it doesn't it doesn't help us to um, tell them exactly what to do, right? So so uh, as Conrad mentioned, we we try to make sure there's a solid structure, 
um, and clear clear goals and a roadmap of where we want to go, and then let them let them operate independently. Um, not only does it give them more ownership, give them um, you know uh, the drive to actually find the best solutions and stuff for themselves, not just you know it's not just being dictated to the top from the top go build it exactly this way, um, but it also allows us to scale better, right? Because um, you know if we can have a bunch of independent teams working um, in in side by side right, towards a common goal um, and collaborating with each other, of course, as well. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and, and kind of one, one of the things I look there, look for there right, in terms of kind of uh, when we talk about rules and, you know, processes and stuff is um, making sure each of the each of the squads are kind of holding themselves accountable, right, that they're that they're being ambitious, they're working towards, um, you know, solving the, the big problems we're, we're putting in front of them. Um, but they're they're also willing to kind of be <laughs> um, honest and, and reflective on you know what are the things that are um, going well, what are the things that that often you know aren't going well and, and need to be smoothed out, right? So so one of the things I really look for is you know when um, when a when a squad commits to some number of tasks for a sprint, right, that they're holding themselves to that, and that's not me holding them to that, right? That's them holding themselves to it, right? And then they can understand kind of um, what they're trying to get done. Um, that helps. One, one, one of the things that happens from that, which is great, is the team start thinking more iteratively, um, and which is, uh, you know, good in terms of breaking up tasks and breaking down work and, and, and being able to estimate a little bit better. But it also ends up often being better for the customer um, because they can then take a big problem and see, hey, how can we maybe deliver value in the next week, right, rather than how can we... Um, deliver value over the next three months, right? And um, continue to add a little bit of value bit by bit iteratively. Um, and it ends up being great because um, like I said, we get more consistency, we get more um, um, better kind of estimates and stuff, but also um, our customers start seeing something of use quickly and we can start getting feedback as well. So um, yeah. I think that draws the the fine line between execution and actual delivery. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that that's something where often you know even really high performing engineers struggle with, right? They're they're working on something, right? But it's like, oh well, I need to get it perfect before it chips out the door and stuff, right? And you know, working with them and saying, hey, yeah, of course, perfect is is well, it's perfect, right? But let's let's see, can we can we get you know something good in front of the customer? Right? Can we make the customers' lives better? this week than it was last week right yeah so uh, we invite all engineering managers or engineers themselves to be a little philosophical in their line of work and always ask why am i doing this what for um so conrad uh, any take of yours on uh, on this from from the product and data or would you just agree one on one with anthony uh, i like a hundred percent agree with anthony um maybe the only thing i'd like to i'd like to add or i'd add is um we're also trying to always pair up people and teams that have diverse skills, right? So not everyone can have kind of every skill. Um, so we're trying to pair people, as I said, to maximize kind of diversity um, also in skills because it then helps to uh, kind of get the right balance between being very detail oriented and, and strict and perfect, but also trying to go fast and explore things, right? It's also often like a personal matter, uh, preference of style, and we're trying to mix up right people and right teams. Okay, and just so we frame this abstract concept, uh, because we're talking about squads, about how to manage people. If LinkedIn is to be trusted, it tells me that there's 110 people at, at GetSafe. I'm guessing more or less it's a, it's a, it's a verified number. Uh, Please nod if it's that. Yeah, okay. Uh, that, yeah. <laughs> the, the squads that you mentioned of the product manager, the, the designer, how many squads are there in total? Yeah, so currently we have five five squads. Um, and they they vary in size. I think the, the smallest is um, three engineers with the lead. Um, and the largest, I think, at the moment, which is a little too big, actually, but is uh, about uh, seven engineers. So. Okay, uh, and if I may ask, out of personal curiosity, when you say too big, uh, at what point does that sort of 
light up as the red light of warning for you. That yeah, is. absolutely. Totally, totally fair question. And this kind of goes back to, you know, the earlier question and kind of what I've learned at past companies and, and what I've tried to, to try to bring along. And, you know, the, the magic number I've kind of found is, is three to five engineers working on, you know, a specific problem set. Um, but that also, um, in, in our, you know, it's always just based on the people you've got and the, the leadership you have at different levels, right? So in our case, it's, um, we have a little bit of a larger problem space that's very interconnected right now where we're trying to figure out over time, you know, and that kind of goes into some of the strategic things we're, we're always discussing is how can we um, try to break up both the, both the product problems a little bit to make them a little bit more independent, but also the technology, right, to make it a little bit more independent so that we could actually let these, let maybe break this slightly larger squad into, into two squads um, working independently, but towards the towards the larger, larger goals. So, um, but yeah, so, so about ev everything over five engineers is kind of where it starts itching at the back of my head and says, okay, we need to figure out what do we need to do overall to make it so we could break this down a little bit more. And, and I think like we, we also use this right type um, kind of to decide how to scale um, a squad notion, right? So we don't think uh, of adding like single engineers, single designers, but more like where can we add a new squad taking over subtopic, splitting up topics, right? Which makes it way easier uh, in the end to scale uh, from my point of view. And then also to explain to people like, what are what are you responsible for, right? Which then um, on the other end adds again to, to having a high alignment and being able to give them autonomy, right? On what they do. That makes complete sense. I really like it that, you know, scaling, of course, you can just drop more engineers and have a more tired and higher backlog team of engineers, but this makes a lot of sense. Is, is there any scenario in which this doesn't work? Or is this just like something that's the clean hygienic standard of development in 2021 and anybody who's not following this is just like legacy or lagging? Well, I, I I don't know if anybody's not following this legacy or lagging. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I know there are other models, you know, um, holacracy and different things, which I think are out of trend now too. But you know, where there's like no, no direct leadership and stuff. But I mean, generally, I found, I, I found this model to work very effectively everywhere I've worked, and whenever we've tried to kind of go away from it, we end up at something kind of similar to it. So um, it, it, it's, it's definitely uh, the model I would recommend for, for basically every tech company, so. No, I think it also, especially, um, as I said, like the path to success is not clear. So strategy might change a bit and it gives us like lots of flexibility, you know, like um, going deeper into the value chain, like splitting up uh, horizontally or splitting up vertically uh, topics as we need them uh, while finding out what the best way to, in the end, um, scale is, right? Yeah, and that's, and that's super critical going to, you know, whether everyone should use this or not, right? It's not something where you just set a squad and forget and you never reevaluate, right? Like it's it's important that, um, you know, you don't want to constantly be shifting the squads around every week, that defeats the point. But where every, you know, quarter or two, you should be evaluating say, hey, is this still the right setup? Do we need to shift anything around? Do we need to split? Do we need to, um, maybe this is not a, as big of a problem as it used to be. Maybe this squad doesn't need to exist and we need to make a different one instead, right? But that's, that's important to be looking at, but if you're doing that, then this kind of consistently works. Solid, solid answer. And Conrad, I have to warn you, it's a little bit of grilling time. Uh, nice. It's a little bit of grilling time because you have data in your job job description. So you know, uh, I have to I have to give a breather over here, and uh, I have to ask you because um, I'm I'm looking through my notes who it was that I actually spoke from Get Safe on LinkedIn. Uh, I think it was Kieran from, uh, Kieran who is uh, uh, leveraging data science and InsurTech. And uh, we, had a, we had an exchange about how currently machine learning, it was about the post why we have a dedicated plat data platform at Get Safe. And uh, I, I asked Kieran if, if there are any uh, cases in which he would recommend against having a dedicated plat data platform in this space. Um, so I won't even just like read it out to you. I'm curious, Conrad, what, what you had to say, um, because uh, right now it was said that the current use case is too simple 
to necessitate machine learning per se in the way that I asked for it. But mm -hmm. uh, Kieran did make the remark, and this works for me, that with the complex analyses and the expansion and between more pipelines and everything, um, then that makes sense. However, and this is coming from a technologically ignorant person more than less. So give me the benefit of the doubt when I ask you to explain it to me like I'm five years old. Machine learning loves data. Data mm -hmm. loves hygiene. And having some data from as far as you can go is cool. And the machine learning part will love it. So is it a healthy approach to just, even if you're trying to use machine learning way, way in the future, or you even don't know if you will, but still having this data hygiene and preparing for that? Because the fact that you don't need it now doesn't mean that you don't have to start preparing for when you will. Um, sure. Um... I agree to you, but I don't think it contradicts each other. You know, I think in the end, you need to find a healthy balance um, between collecting everything and collecting it in a clean way and not spending too much time on it if you don't know if it will provide value in the future, right? I think fortunately, nowadays, there are all the tools out there that do major parts of the job for you, so don't, you don't have to care that much about it, right? And um, I think like the, the blog post, uh, everyone should read it, um, is about that we introduced uh, Dataprix as our data platform, which makes it super, super easy basically to collect any kind of data in any format um, in one, in the end, um, uh, basically on one platform. And so it's super easy. It's kind of plug and play. And then we can later on decide, see what kind of data provides value. Um, and then further refine it, you know. Okay. And and to the use of machine learning, I think it's always, I'm always a fan of always, always uh, coming from the user problem or the business problem and really always making sure that we're solving something real. I think this is even more important as we are a startup and do not have unlimited funds like uh, maybe some large corporates seem to have, right? Um, so we're not just throwing away money and playing around, but we do real business. So it's super important to always have it clear what kind of problem are we solving, what kind of impact does it have, and what's the best solution to it, right? And sometimes we need like a 100% solution. Sometimes we need 80% solution based on that kind of level of ambition that we have or quality we have. We need to find the right tools. If it's machine learning, it's machine learning. If it's a set of simple statistics or rules, it's that, right? So I, I would never just go for machine learning just for the sake of doing it. Okay. Okay, fair response. The, the five-year-old in me is smarter right now, and I understand the, the answer that you gave to me. Right. Um, so, 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 and, and you mentioned that, you know, you're a startup with limited funds, but looking at the way that the market is sharing money with the interesting startups, you are an interesting startup, you are in a very interesting space, I'm sure that you know, uh, at no point will you not be of the interest of, of investors probably oversubscribed with every round. Um, so I think that we have talked a lot about Get Safe, but I would like to expand this into the industry space so we can speak about the, the entire area and ecosystem. And I'm curious because it feels at least for me like sometimes we are reach, reaching a, a ceiling and I'm hoping that you can tell me why it is a glass ceiling that we will easily break through. Because, for example, if I'm thinking about neobanks, okay, you have given me the ability to day trade. You have given me the ability to issue one-time cards. You have given me the ability to exchange currencies. And it's difficult to figure out what could be done next. And likewise, the question here for InsureTech is, okay, sure, the race is for... Uh, smarter evaluation, uh, uh, faster resolution of, of issues. What is the sort of breakthrough? What is the prediction for the, the next big thing in, in SureTech or anything that leads to that? Like, uh, if I may, like, first of all, I, I think we're not even there yet at the level that you described. So I think we're yeah. kind of lagging behind new banks quite, quite a few years. So we've not yet had that breakthrough and of course we want to be part of that leading part of that um so i don't think yet that there is someone out there who provides the, like the perfect digital experience and in insurance um we're trying to do it we're not there yet but we're doing our best right and i'm i'm, I'm confident that, that we can be it um 
And beyond that, I think um, for insurance, there's a whole ecosystem of um, interesting services and directions that um, the whole thing could go then, right? Which is might be all around, um, you know, providing on demand and super personalized coverage for things you want to do. Uh, going more to the maybe B two B space, um, and we're adding a whole ecosystem of uh, preventive, like prevention, risk prevention, which will add another whole dimension of alignment between the user in the end and the company. As if both are trying to prevent risk, it's the best um, that can happen, right? And I think as well there, no one really uh, cracked it um, yet, and it's definitely one topic of the future. Okay, Anthony. I, I think Connor had covered uh, <laughs> um, all the things I would I would probably talk about. You know, I think um, he, he he touched on a very interesting there, right? Is is you know coming back to the data topic, right? Is as we understand, as we have more data, as we know, um, you know, what are the things customers are looking for? What are the things that they actually want to file and claims for? And what are maybe the things that um, their claim gets rejected for because it's actually not covered or they didn't understand their policy or, you know, something like that, right? Over time, we can use that data to provide e kind of exactly the right coverage for users without them actually thinking about it, right? And I think um, you already see this in, in small things, right? You go on, on Amazon and buy a larger item and it says right there, hey, do you want to add the extended warranty, right? I mean, that's basically a form of insurance right it's just you don't think about it that way and sure. at one point we can make sure this is just kind of embedded in everything you do and it shouldn't be crazy expensive it should be um cost effective but so the things you want um you know are covered and you know uh as as life happens it's just you know the things work and if something breaks we can help you take care of it so okay Listening to you, I, I've, I've started thinking, I'm curious if there's ever going to be a product where I can just like temporarily buy insurance. Let's say I'm skiing and I see, okay, this is a, this is a difficult one. Uh, I whip out my phone, say, I want to be insured for the following, let's say 30 minutes from this, this and that and grave danger while skiing. So uh, I, I think we might get to that point, but it, but it might cost you a bit to do it. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. Really, that's the premium. Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah, but we'd have to understand. I want it right now. I haven't yeah. talked about this before. I'm paying the tax for. Well, you know, it's an interesting idea, right? We connect to whatever uh, fitness tracker knows how well you ski, and then based on that, we can analyze. You know, the run. You know, it's it's definitely a possibility, and I mean, I think it's it's not that far fetched. You know, um, and you know, one of the things Get Safe already has, right, is we have. Um, daily cancellation of your insurance policy, which is something uh, most of our competitors don't. It's it's not something they could ever dream of, right? And you know, because we can use technology to assess um, the risk level of, of of our customers, they come on. We could we can afford to do that and allow customers do. We don't have to lock you in uh, for a year at a time. Um, so it, it's definitely something that's that that could be in the future. Yeah. I'll be looking forward. If anybody steals this idea, please at least credit me. So <laughs> here first. Well. So I mean, I didn't mean specifically you, but if you intend on stealing it, then let's let's talk after. Mm -hmm. uh, jokes aside, um, I'm curious about whether what I mentioned, the question that I asked, the the the, the ML, the artificial intelligence. Is that something that's too th much thrown around? Is that a is that a buzzword, especially in the insure tech space? Like, do you get this question? Like, I gave you a lot. Yeah, so, I think so, yeah. Conrad already touched on some of it. I, I I don't think it's I don't think it's just a buzzword. I don't think it's thrown around. Um, but I think too often these days people grab for machine learning earlier than they need to. Right? Um, it's it's. Uh, it definitely has great uses and especially as you have a lot of data but there's still a lot you can do uh, <laughs> with some with some uh, decent rule-based systems and provide a lot of value to your customers and you're not fighting the machine learning systems along the way um but it's but it's absolutely something we're starting to use and will be a you know critical aspect of what we do in the future and i think as you get more into real time and other things it, it gets more interesting right i think um you know one of one of the things about in, insurance is there's a lot happening but it's it's also not necessarily real time yet um 
So some of that matters a little bit less, um, but over time, it's absolutely something that, that will be a part of what we do. And I, th I think most insurance companies, and I think most businesses to some level, even if maybe you're not directly building your own machine learning algorithm and you're using a, a tool that does it for you or something, um, for us, we'll definitely be building our own. Um, but it, 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 yeah, so I, I don't think it's just hype. I don't think it's just a buzzword. I think it's, um, but I do think it's people grab grab for it too quickly. I, I'd maybe add to that, um, totally agree to Anthony. And for me, it's, um, um, again, like user and business problem needs to, needs to come first, right? And then what we're seeing is, especially in the data space, is kind of a satisfaction of everything, um, which is pretty cool. So um, for me, it's not that big of a topic whether to use ML or not in the future. Uh, we do have smart people who know to, within a few hours, set up any kind of ML algorithm, right? Train it and deploy it as an API. The tools are there, and then we can just try it out, right? If it works better than any kind of other rule. So I would vote for rather being kind of agnostic in the end what to use, but having the, the, the skills, you know, team people and skills on board to easily just use whatever we want. Okay, solid. Solid response. Uh, so now I have one thing to throw Anthony's way, one thing to throw Conrad's way, and then we will be wrapping up with just some non-technical questions. Um, so uh, our team has researched this uh, the, this uh, this piece of text. I'll, I'll keep it short. Uh, essentially, the question that I will be asking you is: Is this the thing that is making the incumbent the incumbent? Essentially, is this why the typical insurance companies are not catching up as fast as the neo insurers. And the piece of text tells me this, that a few years back, the incumbent's response to the legacy problem was to move to ERP type process platforms, which were supposed to be somehow hedging against the future. Apparently it didn't work. And back in those decisions, CIOs, CTOs, IT departments weren't really placed in a position of a decision maker or someone who could be telling, yes, great idea, no, terrible idea. So is that the thing that you think is the key sort of bottleneck for incumbents moving to this position where in Get Safe or any other insure tech that we're hearing about on TechCrunch or Sifted, they just understand that tech is as important as, for example, the legal framework of insurance, right? Would this be the thing, the only thing? Are there any other things that are creating this, you know, gap for typical insurance companies to catch up? Yeah, I, I definitely think it's a critical thing. Um, I don't think it's the only thing. Yeah, we, we absolutely have, a, have an advantage in the fact that technology is just in, ingrained into everything we do, right? Every decision um, we make is based on, you know, what can our platform do? What do we need to keep adding to it? How do we, um, you know, what can our app do, et cetera? That's how we make decisions, right? Um, you know, it, it's important. And, you know, uh, one of our, one of our co-founders is our, is our CTO, right? So, you know, from day one, it's been important, right? It's not something that got tacked on at, at some point. We've always been a tech company. Um, but I think there are, there are kind of other large factors um, that's going to keep holding back incumbents for a while, which is just their, you know, they, they have legacy IT systems and, and some of them are really, really legacy. You know, I mean, they're insurance companies that are hundreds of years old at this point, right? Their technology is not quite that old, but, you know, they've, it, it's not uncommon to have um, technology systems that are, that are 40 years old at this point, right? You can't just update those. And um, we, you know, we have, it ingrained into us to use modern technology and always to be innovating, right? We don't, you know, if if a if a tool or technology is no longer the right fit, we update it. It's not a huge deal. We just do it. Um, but but for the incumbents, they might need years to to get new people in, start updating their technologies, figure out how to get all the old stuff over, and not lose things, right? Um, that's going to slow you down. And and that on top of the fact that you know. They're not even making technology first decisions, right? So that's just that's just kind of such a um, mess of legacy holding them back and, and mindset that it, they almost can't can't catch up. Maybe they will at some point, but by then we'll be even further ahead, right? 
Okay. And then, and I maybe add to that next to Anthony was describing perfectly like the tools that we give, but it, again, it also comes down to processes how we how we come to decisions, right? So in my background, I have been at large corporates in Germany all over, so I know decision making of like smaller things can take months and years, and um, for like various reasons, and also be able to while scaling still be fast, breaking things, learning fast, iterating. Um, I think that's that's as well crucial next to just giving the technological tools that we need, right? Yeah. Moving fast, breaking things. That sounds uh, dangerously quote the close to the quote that I heard that if if you have everything under control, you're not moving fast enough, right? Uh, I exactly. Think Formula One uh, driver. Exactly. Um, so, Conrad, first of all, uh, the article that we discussed, the why we have a dedicated data platform, get safe. Everybody in the audience, it's posted in the comments. So have cool. A Thanks. Uh, and now a similar exercise just coming your way. Quote, insurance is about data, internal data while being consolidated into smart new data models and architecture is just not enough for products of the future. Seamless integration with the external global data world is critical and is also a large challenge. And since you already mentioned, you know, fitness tracker, I know that insurance companies, I, I, I have a good hunch what you're going to tell me, but uh, let's see, maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, so I, I totally agree. External data is crucial, critical to our business. Um, but I, to be honest, fully honest, I don't see a specific challenge in it um, because I also see that, um, as I said, like there's a certification of, of data, data providers all over. So there are plenty of uh, opportunities to get the data they want in a modern format over API um, and using a very modern tech stack on our own. Um, I don't see a specific challenge in integrating it, right? It's rather, again, like deciding what to do uh, more than uh, seeing the, getting the right data in and doing the right things with it, rather than having a challenge in getting it. But I totally agree, it's, it's crucial. Um, and for me, the magic in the end happens somewhere between uh, wrangling internal data and external data in the end, right? Because it gives a kind of a market view and it enriches internal data but also the internal data gives a very good view on the user. And I think we have a super high competitive advantage in there as we digitize the whole value chain. Um, so we kind of know about every touch point that the customer has with us and can use all of the data. Uh, we have it all in one place. Um, so to be honest, it's rather easy for us to wrangle it with any kind of external data that we might add now that we add it or might add in the future. Okay, okay. Anthony? Any anything to add here? Uh, I, I think I mean I think that that definitely covered a lot of it, right? You know, we're we're always on the lookout for for new opportunities, and I think um, this is going to continue to happen. And and yeah, there's just there's always going to be more data available, and I think it's it's important to assess whether it adds add to value, right? I think it's kind of like what we talked about earlier with the machine learning stuff, right? Is it's easy to get distracted by things that maybe don't don't add anything. So just just assessing appropriately. But yeah, I mean the opportunities I think are becoming endless. I think it's uh, more opportunities than challenges. Fair point. Fair point. Good good situation to be in. Because uh, when I think of this, I know that one Polish insurer, I think the largest Polish insurer, gives you a device that goes in your car that tracks your motion. It has a gyroscope, has an accelerator. So it knows, for example, when something all of a sudden stopped your car. Uh, I know that in the US there are insurance who are giving you an Apple Watch with the policy so they can in turn see what's your sleeping habits, walking habits, whether you're a high risk, low risk, excellent kind of person. Do you know about any of those like cool next, next, next thing applications outside of the ones that I mentioned? Yeah, I mean, there's there's starting to be stuff also with, you know, home insurance where you've got IoT devices and, and you're out monitoring water flow and, and different things with pipes to see if you've got a leak. Um, you know, that's that's one that I know is kind of, but, but there are just, there are lots of possibilities and I think we don't even know yet. But, um, uh, you know, I think especially when you see the large insurers doing this, it's, it's I think at this point, it's a, it's a great idea. Um, it's, it's definitely something we're going to embrace at one point as well. But I, uh, my gut feeling is that the larger insurances are uh, are doing it more as a gimmick at the moment, and to understand and to learn, um, okay. that they're really using it to to make decisions. But but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they are actually already making critical decisions off of it. 
let's see. Let's see. Healthy competition is always good. Uh, so enough of the tech. Now, a very personal, non-technical questions. Number one, and Conrad un unfortunately already started answering this in a previous oh, question. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, decision-making framework. What is the tip that you can share with other leaders how to improve decision-making? For example, the rule of thumb, let's say, do I like cake? Yes, cake is great. Is it great for me? Not in the amount that I would like to eat it. So a similar approach to a very simple decision-making framework. What helps you make a tough call or anything really that resonates with this question? Mm -hmm. I, I can think of uh, two points. Um, uh, and the first one is kind of a prerequisite for me. Without that, it, any kind of framework won't work. And that's having a good strategy and a good goal setting that you discussed, right? It's also this, a decision you made, but it's a very specific decision that you can then align on. You can write it down. You can discuss it with your teams. Um, and then any further discussion, uh, decision, more operational decision, is way easier Um basically to make, because you can also always refer back to your strategy and the goals that you set, right? So I mentioned we're using OKR framework, which is great. Um, that really helps a lot, right? And it also enables, as I said, teams to take their decision on their own. So I love a world where I don't need to take decisions, uh, but teams can take decisions on their own. And through alignment, we can make sure I would have decided the same, right? That's the perfect world and we're striving for it. Um, the second point is, I think, what I learned, it's also something I learned in consulting, is um, the disagree and commit principle, right? It's uh, get everyone, if there's an important decision to take, get everyone in who's basically uh, affected. Uh, take your time really to discuss it and let everyone be heard. Um, but then if you take a t decision together, then you commit to it and not afterwards uh, start saying, okay, this has not been the right decision. Why did we take the decision, etc.? Why? Because it it will make you slow. It stops you down. Okay. What was the name of disagree and commit? Disagree and commit. Yeah. Cool. Cool. First cool. disagree, but then commit. Right, and then there's okay. no way back. Okay. Then even but maybe Anthony. Then we made it together, essentially, at some point. Exactly. Okay. Solid. Solid. So I'll, I'll research it. I haven't heard about this framework earlier. Uh, Anthony? Yeah, absolutely. I think I think one of the big things I'm always trying to, to look at is, you know, I love this idea. I, th I think it's from Jeff Bezos, kind of one-way door decisions versus two-way door decisions. So basically the idea is, you know, one-way door, you make the decision, it's it's basically impossible to, to change it, right? Or it's incredibly expensive, right? Two-way door decision, you can go through it, you know, if it doesn't work out, you, you know, you change your mind, relatively low cost, right? So first thing I always try to do is you know, identify what kind of a decision we're dealing with here. Is it one way or two way? If it's a two way door decision. Um, you know, I try to make sure we we make it quickly. I often try to um, give the opportunity to my team to make it right. Um, and and you know, let's see where we go from there. If it, if it's a one way door decision, then yeah, we need to you know spend a little more time um, discussing it in detail, getting people together, um, and and going from there. So. Okay. Uh, if it's any measure of, of wisdom and a correct answer, Anthony, our last week's guest, uh, the current CTO of, of Chow Now, so uh, uh, ordering company, uh, he spent almost 11 years at Amazon and he shared a similar uh, one way, two way door. So uh, <laughs> good, good on you. Good on you. Definitely a good response. Uh, and now the magic wand question. So here are two remote magic wands that I have just handed into you and you are supposed to wave it and after abracadabra every 12 year old in the world will have access to some piece of education or will be taught that specific thing we have heard emotional intelligence design thinking financial prudence coding of course that comes a lot and there's no right or wrong answer I just want to hear why this is the answer that you give. just make it yours for me so Conrad Sure. Um, I tell them to, or educate them to stay curious and stay open-minded about whatever comes. Um, it's very important, I think. And the second point I'd make is uh, spend your time on relevant problems. Um, but it's totally okay to have fun in between. That's my two points. Anthony? 
Yeah, um, I think probably um, making sure kind of everybody learns to understand and take the time uh, um, to, you know, if, sorry, if, if to understand if somebody's on the other side of an issue from you to actually understand the reasoning behind it, the why, right? And I think um, this can be incredibly important in, in work context, right? I think too often people, um, you know, uh, I think we do a pretty good job of not not doing this to get safe, right? But I think too often people just make the wrong assumptions and say, "Oh yeah, you're just wrong," right? Without understanding what what your reasoning is, right? Because because often you've you've got you know a specific explanation, you've got your own motivation, and when you can understand that, you can often come together to come come up with a better solution. Um, I think it's really important in work, but I think it's also something that can be uh, really relevant in you know personal lives and also when kind of understanding the the larger world and and maybe why. Uh, people disagree with you on a, you know, political or cultural issue or something where, where people are too often getting these, uh, no, only one side can be right. So, yeah. and then the learning to code, I think everybody should learn to code. Ah, oh, you <laughs> must say that. <laughs> I mean, you know, even, even doctors have to, in, in, if you want to be a relevant doctor in five, 10 years time, well, you gotta, you gotta. So essentially, uh, know thyself and that would be it. And, uh, the good advice it's, I, it's a nice quote I heard. When in doubt, zoom out for some more self-awareness, right? That's so, a great quote, yeah. So, so we can work with that. Uh, it's been a lovely 58 minutes. I have done all the questions that I had. Uh, any finishing remarks? Any uh, hiring announcements? Should all the developers listening to this just go on the careers page and go crazy? Yeah. We're yes, hiring. <laughs> we are hiring a lot of people, uh, front and back no. engineers. Yes, please. If you want to be part of uh, making insurance a lot better for people uh, and for the future, please uh, contact us. Come, come work at GetSafe. So, and probably the same time zone that we are in. So, anybody who's watching, don't don't be afraid of a minus nine time zone or anything like that. Um, okay, gentlemen, thank you so much for today. It's been a blast. I really enjoyed it. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It was cool. Great chat. And uh, well, what else can I say? Dear audience, thank you for attending and see you next week, like every Tuesday. Thanks a lot. Bye, everybody. Goodbye. Bye. Ciao. Thanks.